Father, we thank you for your presence tonight, Lord. We glory in the fact that you have come to us, Father. We did not even know you were coming. We didn't realize. We didn't understand the scriptures, the prophecy. We didn't know the hour. We realized that people guessed at it, and many people had thoughts which were fairly good as far as human reason is concerned, but they did not know for sure until you sent a prophet to vindicate your word for us, to let us know this was the hour that such a word was coming to pass, even, Lord, as we saw in Matthew 4 and Matthew 12, how the minister of the Son of Man would return to this earth again, the very prophecy of Luke 17:30 being fulfilled. And we realize, Father, that that is only because you sent a prophet and showed us the way. We had a light leading to the light, even as John the Baptist was a light leading to the light. And we thank you for that, that we can honestly say that the Bible days are here again in the sense of that great ministry that you had given to your son and you yourself being in it and indwelling him to that extent. Once more, we've seen that ministry and seen the glory of God. And so, Father, tonight may we be very solemn in our thinking and very happy to know that we have a true word, a true revelation, and we can walk in that light. And in that light, Lord, there is no darkness, there's no veil, there's no shadow of turning. It is all truth, absolutely the truth, because you are the truth and the way and the life, and we appreciate that. So may we give you honor and glory tonight as we study, and may the honor and glory be true from the from our hearts, Lord, and may our hearts be one with yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now we're continuing tonight in the message of Brother Branham's on uh, identification, and of course we understand very thoroughly that this is the subject wherein he is dealing with the... Um, identification of the believer and in some respects the unbeliever uh, according to the Word of God. So in studying this message one does not need to read very many pages before one realizes that Brother Branham actually is referring to the second parable mystery which the parables are mysteries and they're called mystery in the Bible. The parable mystery of Matthew 13 verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43 wherein Jesus defines the whole so-called human race as being one lump of humanity formed from two sources who are physically indistinguishable at least at this time even more so than any time in history and their true origins are known only to God only God knows the difference, nobody else knows. The foundation of God stand is sure of this seal the Lord knoweth them which are his. And God who will forever separate them at the great white throne judgment where the true seed of God goes on to the new heavens and earth and the seed of the devil, the enemy, goes to eternal, eventual annihilation. So we can go to uh, the book of uh, <coughs> Matthew and <coughs> what we're doing is repeating a lot of what we've already said, but trying to get a clear emphasis upon it and uh, continue as rapidly as we can. So in Matthew, the 13th chapter, and uh, reading verses uh, 24 to 30, another parable put he forth uh, to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, you'll notice in the kingdom of heaven here and the kingdom of earth, uh, most students will tell you that positively they actually are indistinguishable. But to me, this scripture here, when he talks the kingdom of heaven, it lets you know that God himself is absolutely concerned about this and revealing to us what goes beyond the earth. Because this takes you right to the end where there will be no earth left and nothing there. So it goes right to annihilation. So we can keep that in mind and, and look in this not as merely the kingdom of earth, the kingdom which is of God on earth, <clears throat> but we're looking at that which is over and above all. So you can see a beginning and you can see an ending. 
And the king was like unto man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said to them, An enemy hath done this. The servants <coughs> said to him, Wilt thou then we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay, while, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather together the tares, and, bundle, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into the, into the garner, or into the barn. Now, you notice in there, if you know anything much about, and I'm sure we all do, we know quite a bit about uh, gardening. And when it comes to gardening, uh, <coughs> you uh, plant your plants that are good, and uh, there are certain uh, plants that grow up, and uh, they, you call them weeds. And uh, a lot of them have a deep tap root. They grow way down. A lot of them have fibrous roots, and they spread way out. But they're a nuisance. Now, what they're doing is they're taking the nourishment out of the soil. They're taking the, uh, the uh, moisture out of the soil. And they're crowding out the wheat. And they're actually a detriment uh, to the crop that you planted. Uh, they, they cause problems. But uh, I have a friend who uh, I used to know many years ago, and I've known over the time, and he has an organic farm in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and uh, I would marvel at him how that uh, <clears throat> he would put the good fish oil and the good products on his soil to have good food there, organically grown food. And uh, you could see these weeds nourish. Man, alive. I never saw weeds in my life that had so many seeds. They were luxurious. I'm absolutely fantastic. And I thought, now that's kind of stupid. He doesn't pull them up. He doesn't bother. It wasn't worth his while. Now that's what the Bible said. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And the weeds can rejoice in the, in the goodness of God in nature and the goodness of God in his kingdom. Now this is the kingdom of heaven we're talking about. And it's a mixed bag. You've got wicked seed, you've got good seed. And God is over it all, and it's all his kingdom. And so you can't say to him like these servants said, now, why don't you tear up these uh, weeds and get them out of the way? And if you get them out of the way, the weed is going to flourish that much better. No, it's, it, it, it doesn't work that way. And he said, let them both come to the harvest. <clears throat> so I see these weeds in there, and you could tell that with no time at all, they beat the stuffing out of the, out of the wheat and out of the vegetables when it came to harvest because, woo, they just exploded in seed. They were just all over the place, and, and their growth was phenomenal. Now, uh, that's what David saw, the wicked spreading, spreading like the great green bay tree. He couldn't understand how they seemed to have everything fall in their laps. And so anyway, we go to the next portion here, <clears throat> and we start at verse 36 to 43 <clears throat> to get the revelation. Then when Jesus sent the multitude away, the disciples say, declare to this the parable, the, uh, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said, he that sows the good seed is the son of man. Uh, the field is the world. Now remember, the son of man, he's referring to himself there now, but remember, he, he goes way back to being the first begotten of God, and through him God creating all things. And also you got the understanding, son of man refers to prophet, too. So you, you really got word involved here, and uh, creative word, and whatever word there else is there, predictive, and so on. And he answers, uh, and the field is the world, and the good seed of the children of the kingdom, and the tares are the children of the wicked one. Well, now if the children, good seed, are the children of the kingdom, then they've got to have some kind of a father. Because you don't say, well, these are children of the kingdom without having a king. There wouldn't be a kingdom without a king. So these are the children of the king when it comes to it. And the tares are the children of the wicked one. And who's the wicked one? Well, there's only one great person that's outside of God, and that's the devil. Now, we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about creation. The enemy now here, he tells you the truth. The enemy sold them as the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be the end of this world. And the Son of Man shall send forth these angels, and they shall gather out of the kingdom things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And shall cast them in a furnace of fire, and they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. <clears throat> now you've got the kingdom entirely divested 
of every plant the Heavenly Father has not planted. And he's talking about people. People. We've got to understand that these are people. See? Who has an ear to hear, <clears throat> let him hear. Now, there's no doubt at that time uh, their ears to hear were fine, but they weren't in tune for the end time message. And even the day of Paul, who understood this very thoroughly, John the Revelator, and they had the revelation, they understood, but they merely gave it to the people in the form of that hour, which was the sowing more than reaping. But we at the end time know the mystery because as men of authority, uh, political historians will tell you if you don't understand history, you don't understand the present. You got to look back. And as you look back, you see everything coming up, coming up, and you got a pattern. <clears throat> well, now, we're the only ones that could look back at the time of the harvest. And so we have a tremendous revelation of this subject. It's no longer in doubt. There's no longer any misunderstanding or miscuing, uh, wrong interpretations. We have thus saith the Lord, because this is the hour of the reaping according to a vindicated prophet, which we know to be Brother Branham. <clears throat> All right, now, the question now rises, who are these seed according to the scripture? Are, and uh, are they identified as to their source and from whence they came, how did they come into being? Now, <clears throat> it's told here, Jesus tells it, but let's go over to 1 John 5 and hear what John has to say, who also was a scribe when he wrote the book of Revelations. So in John, 1 John 5, uh, let's see, maybe not 5, 1 John 3. So in 1 John 3, beginning at verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Now, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. <clears throat> now, when you talk about the works of the devil, and you talk about the destruction of the seed, you're getting right to the place where you understand Jesus said, and John confirms it, this is the work of the devil. The work of the devil is a mixed people, humanity. Now, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And we know what sin is. Sin is unbelief. So now, nobody would know that except for a prophet like William Branham. Because you could have a hundred ideas of what this is all about. When it says here that he, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And you get to where the Nazarenes were and, the, and some Methodists who have kidded themselves that they're sanctified holy. The root of sin is taken out and now they never sin. Well, that's the biggest sin they ever sinned when they said they don't sin because now they have crucified Jesus Christ the second time and not only crucified and they've killed him dead, dead, dead with no resurrection because they don't need the intercessor to keep him in. So they killed it all. See, that's your, that's your Nazarenes <laughs> and your Methodists, free Methodists. And remember, Luther never preached that kind of garbage. I've read, I've read Luther. I can't find one place where he had eradication. There's no way. Brother Branham was right. You sin a thousand times a day, backslide a thousand times a day. <clears throat> and if it weren't for Jesus, through the sacred blood, the high priest's office, we wouldn't have access to God. We need that now at this time. Later on, we simply worship around the throne, glorifying God with him. But at this time, you better have an intercessor, a high priest. So, what is, un, what is sin? Unbelief. Sin entered, and death by sin. What was it? She didn't believe. Adam turned on it. So it's gone. You've got sinners right there. For he, now watch, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. <clears throat> now, the question will be then, when did that birth take place, or when will it take place, if we haven't got it now, to get to the place, if these people are right, that you can come to the place where you won't sin? Now, sin to them is what Brother Branham called attributes of sin. <laughs> Smoking, drinking, having a great time of filth in the world. 
So you see, what I'm talking this way is to keep you well aware of how we differ so conclusively from everybody else. And I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the doctrine that Brother Branham gave, which was vindicated by God. And we are a part of it. <clears throat> In this the kingdom the children of God are manifest, and the children of the, de of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now, the interpolation in there is neither he that loveth not his brother and so on. Forget that. That's an interpolation. That's something that is extraneous in the sense that is not a part of the individual specifically and essentially as to his essentiality of seed of God, it's just how he acts. You follow me? Sure, a tiger acts a certain way, but essentially he is tiger life, right? Then there's a life of God, period, and it acts a certain way. But don't get mixed up in the acting because at the end time, the two spirits are so close that you might find one out shining the other as far as action's concerned. So you got to have something else in there. And remember, the seed of God does not have unbelief. And, but the seed of the devil has unbelief. <clears throat> See, liar from the beginning. Now, it says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Now it tells you right there, the wicked one starts with Cain. So he definitely is the seed of the devil. Now, he's categorized as that. He's not born of any sperm the devil has. No way, shape, and form. Because at the end time, it's brute beast. It doesn't say devils, 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 and the devil, devil, devil. It said brute beast. So this, the start here is with the beast. Because the end is with the beast. And it's the beast in the garden and the beast at the end that starts the whole trail of the serpent and ends the trail, which is the kingdom of the devil. <clears throat> or the tares. You follow me? Okay, it's very, very simple. Just let your thinking go. Not as Cain, who was that wicked one, and slew his brother. <clears throat> now notice the brother is there. It's after the flesh. Because they're both children of Eve. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. <clears throat> now what was the evil work of Cain? Refusing the blood because he refused to believe that he was serpent seed. He could not take it. He said, no, I am not the son of the serpent. I am not the son of the beast. And we're going to show you some of the things about that. But his brother's was righteous. <clears throat> he said, yes, I am a child of God. I am in sin and I need a blood offering. See, one acquiesced entirely to the word of God. The other turned his back and fought. Became a murderer even. So now you can see here that positively, when you are talking <clears throat> about the children of the kingdom and the children of the devil or the children of this world, their origin is in Cain and Abel. Now remember, Abel gets killed. But the continuation goes to Seth. And Abel is dropped out of the genealogy because he has no children. He's a beautiful type of Christ because as the blood of Abel called from the ground and having no children, the blood of Jesus Christ called forth to and brought his children up. <clears throat> so you got a type in there and the scripture calls it a type. No, no two ways about that. <clears throat> now, so there are two children here. And of course, uh, they are named right here. And it says, marvel not my brethren, that the world hate you. Now remember that Cain hated Abel. So Cain is of the world. So he's a child of the world. He is not a child of God. <clears throat> now if he's a child of the world and he's a living force and entity, then he must be some type of creation and falls in the line of some type of creation which produces itself and would be able to produce itself in the human race to such an extent that it'd be close, so close <clears throat> to the individual that God breathed the life into that now they could intermingle. Because remember, I started out showing you is one lump. 
And you'll find that all through the scripture, the one lump, they're in, you can't tell who is who, except under very certain conditions, which we'll, Brother Branham goes into, and we'll go into also here according to the word that he <clears throat> brings to us. Now, both Cain and Abel are in the Genesis account of the beginning of the earth's population, and they are two different seed according to John. That's just absolutely what it says here. <clears throat> and you're going to find the Pentecostals who done it, who don't know anything except their sheer stupidity, will try to argue with the rest of the legalists that this of is not indicative of being paternity. See, that's why they'll never understand what Brother Brandon preaching what I'm preaching. They can't understand seed. It isn't in them. Now, it will be a little while tonight on this subject here, but I want to go and show you some things that are so very, very pertinent as we go along. <clears throat> now, so all right, both Cain and Abel in the Genesis account of the beginning of the earth's population, because they're the two firstborn, and they are two different seed according to John. Now, J John wrote this according to the Holy Ghost, so this is the word of God. Since this is unequivocally so, and both were born of Eve, one child could not have come from Adam, because in Genesis 2 and 7, and let's read it now, <clears throat> let's just find out what the Bible says and just stick with the Bible. Of course, people aren't going to stick with the Bible because they, there's no way. You know why? Because they're the devil. You can't convince the devil a bunch there of the devil, and they'll prove it by killing you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're screaming you down. 2 and 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of lives and man became a living soul. <clears throat> now it tells you right there where Adam got his soul and where the body got the life. It all started right there when God breathed in his nostrils and Brother Branham categorically said this is not just human breath or wind, this is the Holy Ghost. So God breathed into Adam, gave Adam a portion of the Holy Ghost which made him a living soul, <clears throat> which qualified him now as the bearer of the life of Almighty God to bring forth children unto God. The populator of the earth is Adam. And remember, Eve came out of Adam. And so she is, at one time was, joint heir with him, over creation and everything else, right, along, right alongside of it. And a sacred vessel and a child bearing, which women still are today. <clears throat> now, we go to Luke 3 and 38, and we read the account given by God to Luke. Remember, Luke is a scribe, and he was a, a good friend of the Apostle Paul. He was a physician. And the verse I want is verse uh, 38. Now it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Or you can put it in plain English. This one, Canaan was of Enos. Enos came from Seth. Seth came from Adam. And Adam came from God. <clears throat> so all right. You have here then positively... One person who is a seed of God, mentioned by John, which is Abel, and you have one which is a seed of the beast. Because when it is all over, at the white throne, they are called natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed. You have a beast race and you have a God race. And only God knows the difference. The kingdom of God stands the sure having this seal, the Lord, and nobody but the Lord knows who are his. <clears throat> but we can know by the so-called word test. And you're going to find everybody wants to give the word the spirit test, and we're smart enough to give the spirit the word test. Even our kids know that. How old is Jared? Six even seven, he know, even he knows that. Who did he give the word test to, John? <laughs> Somebody. I think, well, I think it was Jared. <clears throat> even our kids know that. There's a generation coming up, brother, sister, going to make the rapture, and you better believe it. And they're sitting amongst us. They're sitting amongst us. Or there's some kind of a peculiar 
God out there that I thought I knew and thought belonged to Brother Bran and Brother Bland belonged to him. But what happened? See, you got to know. I'm with Brother Bran. If we're not bride, there's a bride out there somewhere. There's a bride out there somewhere. Now, <clears throat> the next question is, how did Cain get here? For he is certainly not the seed of God. He is not in the genealogy. <clears throat> so he cannot be. He's extraneous. He's outside. He's from some other source. And the Bible says he is of the wicked one. And the wicked one is the devil. And the devil sowed the seed. And the devil cannot create. He does not have his own creation. He does not have his own kingdom. All he can do is use every single thing that God Almighty created through Jesus Christ. And remember, the thousands of fallen angels that went with Satan and fell were not his. They were God's. Possessively. I'm using the term G-O-D-S or capital G-O-D apostrophe S showing possession. <clears throat> and he talked them into going with him. So now, he will use, no doubt, and we do know, the beast, which was the smartest of all creation. Now, you know that Satan sealed up the sum of wisdom. Brilliant, beautiful. So who would he use? Some little stupid muckraker down there like a worm, a science tried to tell you he came from a worm or a polywog? Ha! Ah, stupid. They came from the beast. Clever, brilliant, smart, beautiful. <clears throat> See? So, no genealogy. The answer is evident in Scripture if one is willing to believe the Bible record. So let's go to the Bible record, and I'm going to tell you what I see because I'm basing it upon what Brother Branham taught. And it says over here in the book of Genesis, second chapter, 7 and 9, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathing his nostril, the breath of life, or the breath of lives, and he became a living soul. So if he became a living soul, what will he propagate? Living souls. <clears throat> Just that simple. Now the Mormons got an idea that souls are all, it's the spirits are going to come down from heaven. So all the men had their glorious idea. We'll have a great big harem. We'll have 30 wives or 40 wives. We'll have a thousand kids. And please God, by bringing all these spirits and souls down. Yeah. You talk about hogwash and rubbish. You talk about senility. The droopy, goopy kind of it. Man, I, I get revulsed, and I hope you get repulsed at what I say, so you'll understand how re repelling it is to me. It re it, it's so nauseating. It tells you right here, this man had the, the life. It says here, God went in the breath of lives, and he became a living soul. If he was a living soul, what would he propagate? Souls. That's why Brother Branham said, you were in your father. And he said, you are in God. Then here's the line. Children of God, seed of God. <clears throat> Following? It's very, very simple. Okay, we keep reading. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed in that garden. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight. So the seed must have been there already. He planted the seed. And good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> now over here in the same chapter, <clears throat> 13th verse. Uh, no, let's see, we don't have the 13th verse. We can go, uh, oh, 7, 15 verse is good enough. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat it, for a day in the eating thereof thou shalt surely die. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's compare verse 9. And the Lord God made, uh, out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. And that you, that, now that's a period right there, really. Then as an afterthought, it says, oh, there's something else i got to tell you. The tree of life is in the middle of that garden. I placed it there, and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> They're there, too. Now, it says here that every tree that came out of the ground was good to eat. Now, that's what it says. I'm not making that up. That's the Bible. 
Very good. You're going to eat it. Fine, pleasant. But it says over here, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life now. You're going to eat it if you want to. <clears throat> uh, that's yours if you want it. Over here, you better be careful because you shouldn't take this one. This is your testing ground, your proving ground. I don't want you to eat this tree of the knowledge of good and evil because if you eat it, in the day of the eating thereof, dying thou shalt surely die. In 1,000 years, nobody's ever lived 1,000 years. Now, if that tree will kill you, it never came out of the ground. So therefore, it wasn't apples, apricots, or prunes, or anything else. <clears throat> it did not come out of the ground. It's purely symbolic. <clears throat> the tree of life that was there will also be in the new, in the new Jerusalem. You don't find the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> because nothing that defiles will be in that kingdom. This can defile. This is bad. Whatever this is, this will kill you. And it's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is not the tree of life. So therefore, life does not come by the knowledge of anything good or evil. <clears throat> you follow me? Now let's keep this in mind because if I ever get to Brother Branham's sermon, you're going to have this thrown right at you. Life doesn't come any other way but by a very certain way. And you can study all the mechanics of biology and everything in this world, but unless there's a sperm and an egg there, and the sperm has life, and the egg is able to take the life, there won't be any babies. That has nothing to do with knowledge. That has everything to do with reality. Is it there or is it not there? And your knowledge doesn't have one thing to do with it. <clears throat> but when you let knowledge come in, you can mess up and corrupt every single thing that's in this earth that is real. Except you can't get down to the intrinsicality of the life of God. That's incorruptible because that can never be deceived or changed. But anything on the exterior, anything where that life is or any other life, there can be a problem there. So you notice in here, those two trees, life and knowledge of good and evil, did not come out of the ground. They were simply placed there. <clears throat> they were there. Okay. Now, in Genesis 3, <clears throat> 1 to 20, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, there's no doubt about it. God made that beast. <clears throat> and he made him very, very subtle. Now, you notice right in here, that if the tree of the knowledge is going to be able to kill you, there has to be a relationship between this beast and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because you're going to get killed by partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this rascal right here is the fellow that does it. So now you got a connection. <clears throat> the connection is an animal of the most brilliant abilities, subtle, cunning. <clears throat> and the beast said to the woman in the garden, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now look at the conversation. <clears throat> He's leading her right to the tree that you can't eat of. He's bringing a question. And with his question, he's going to bring knowledge. Knowledge will not bring life unless it's the knowledge of the Word, the knowledge of God. <clears throat> this is where Brother Branham gets his whole thesis on human reasoning, that Eve turned to reasoning. She left the principle of faith, and the Word of the living God revealed to her, and she began reasoning, because the devil began reasoning. He said, just a minute now. Is there a tree here that God said you shall not eat? And she said, yes. We can eat of all the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which amidst the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, <clears throat> neither shall you die, neither shall, uh, lest you die. Now, you notice that the question came up here. 
He said, Yea, God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And he noticed that she volunteered a whole lot of information. <clears throat> she could have said, Yeah, there's a tree called the knowledge of good and evil, which we uh, which were forbidden. But no, she got she got to embellish it. Well, she said, We can eat of every single tree, and she went through the whole course, no doubt, and did a little song and dance. Pentecostal style, maybe, the first framing evangelist, as a certain fellow said. And so she began telling him. <clears throat> how she said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. I don't, even, I don't know any scripture that says touch it. She might have had some further instruction or ideas. The serpent said to the one, you shall not surely die. For the Lord God to know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. <clears throat> now he's telling her right there, now look, the knowledge of good and evil that's in this tree, you can have both sides of the dime. You can have one side, the, the, the tails, you can have the heads, or they say one side and the flip side. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. So look, you can, you, you, I, I can instruct you so that it's a win-win, not a lose-lose. Now God says it's a lose. He said it's not lose, it's a win-win. <clears throat> I'll show you. You can have your cake and eat it. You can listen to me and listen to God. There is no difference in believing God and then in believing science. And the Bible calls a science so-called as philosophy and it's a bunch of hogwash. And I wouldn't believe a scientist if, he, if, if even he could produce a miracle, but he can't. Because they're lying signs and wonders. <clears throat> so he's getting her to the world of science. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, Pleasant the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also her husband with her, and he did eat. Now you know you got you got metaphor in here. You got symbology. <clears throat> if you go to the book of the Songs of Solomon, you'll find sexual intercourse absolutely uh, illustrated as eating. You find it right there. In fact, the, the, the Songs of Psalms has been called the pornographic book of the Bible. And when people want to talk about pornography and say it's perfectly legitimate, they refer to that book and say, well, the Bible's full of pornography. There it is right here. Pornography is fine. It's okay. <clears throat> no problem. They don't have a clue that this has to do with Christ and the bride. And as Brother Branham says spiritual, sexually, and of course, they don't, have a, they don't have a clue to any of these things. They can't line it up with life as it is. So they go completely overboard. Now, now, then when they ate, and the woman saw that the fruit was, was treated good for food, pleasant in the eyes, treated desire to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and gave, did eat, gave to her husband, and he did eat. The eyes then both were open, they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and so on, and right down, it, it comes down to the end, where the, verse 14, the Lord said to the woman, no, let's go up here. Uh, in verse 11, he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten the tree which I commanded thee, thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. <clears throat> and the Lord God said to the woman, What is it thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. That's, he absolutely destroyed me morally and physically. Spiritually, right down the line, that shows complete seduction where she's morally defiled. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, by every beast of field upon thy belly, thou shalt go. Eat dust all the days of thy life, and put enmity in right down the line, put enmity in the woman. And then down here in verse 19, The sweat of the, thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. <clears throat> now you notice that, that this in itself would be a lie if you could make this refer to anything but the body because nothing came out of the ground except the body. The creative part of man and woman was spiritual, and they had a spirit body that they were in. They were spirit beings, and he put them in a body. So now he's saying right here, you have lost your ability to be immortal. You have now become mortal, is what you have become. <clears throat> and they really, and they most certainly did <clears throat> become mortal. Now, with what we read here in Genesis 1, or rather 3, 1 to 20, and we, no, and we notice in here we, the 20th verse, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And it says right there that the human race, the one lump has two mothers, but it only has, 
uh, I beg your pardon, one mother, <clears throat> but it has two fathers. And that's been proven scientifically. Brother Brown has said science approved this message. About 99.999% are of one kind of a father and the other of another father. But you still don't know who's the child of Adam by descent. Where that life came from, which is carried by the sperm. We, you can't tell. Because they're so close together, there's no way of knowing. <clears throat> All right. Now with that, we, we, want, we look at Genesis 2. 17, uh, and Adam's, unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hath eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now, <clears throat> this is fulfilled from that is Genesis 2 and 17 has been fulfilled here and is being fulfilled because he listened to the woman which he should not have listened to. So, now let me see, get over here. That was 3 and 17, but I'm sorry, I got to get back to, to, oh, back to 17. I gave you the wrong verse. But of the tree of the Lord is a good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day of the eating of dying, thou shalt surely die. That was, a, that was prophesied back there. And in verse 19 of 319, that's what I want, the third chapter. In the sweat of thy face shall eat bread, and for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. So in the one place he is saying here, look, if you partake of this, <clears throat> if you go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, <clears throat> and remember, it's not, it's not a tree, it's, symbol, it's symbology. He said, you are going to go back to dust. Because from dust you are, and dust you shall return. Now, <clears throat> to be the key, the true key of this is found in 1 Timothy, the second chapter. Because we're looking at the fact of what was done here in the garden, which was a physical act which should have never taken place the way it took place. So in 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, Paul says, let the woman, the woman learn in subjection, I beg your pardon, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach. Now she can learn, but she can't teach. Nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. <clears throat> now even if she thinks she knows something, she hasn't got a voice in the matter. And she could know something, but it's beyond her pale. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now watch, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now notice what it says. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now I want to ask you a question. What in the world has procreation or childbearing got to do with eating apples? It's got nothing to do with eating apples. <clears throat> not any way, shape, and form. So it tells you very, very distinctly here that it's not a matter of disobedience in any area as though no particular area mattered or eating of some particular fruit. It's a very particular, strict thing that was done because it has to do with childbearing. You don't penalize people having a tough time in pregnancy because he eat apples. It might be apple do them on a world of good, deliver from having a lot of pain. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the act itself that brings forth children, the procreative act, must have been absolutely wrong to bring this penalty, which is even here to this very hour, which it is. So okay, we go back to Genesis, the third chapter. <clears throat> and two to seven, we read it before. The woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the tree of the fruit of the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it. Now you notice in there she said a tree, but there was two trees there. One you could, one you didn't. The serpent said, surely you shall not die. For the Lord doth know in the day of the eating of it, 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 your eyes shall be open, and you'll be as God's knowing good and evil. And then the woman said she, she thought it was good for food, and the eyes of them both were open, and they sowed fig leaves.
together. Now, that's what you see concerning this very story there <clears throat> of what happened. Now, get your tape over. Since it is a natural matter that we understand <clears throat> from Scripture that the serpent got with Eve, the beast, and was the father of Cain. Let's just take a look at this tree of the knowledge of good and evil to see if I can come up with something that may make this a little more lucid in our thinking. <clears throat> so, at this point where we know that God said, don't touch this particular area. It'll bring death to your bodies. And we know that because out of the dust you came, out of the dust you go. That's spoken to the flesh, to the carcass, to the tabernacle, to the body, to the house, whatever you want to call it. But not to the soul. There's no way. Not even to the spirit part. <clears throat> no way. Because the Bible teaches us categorically when you die, there's a separation three ways. The spirit goes back to God who gave it. Now that's allowed of God, but not of God. It's not the Holy Spirit. The soul goes either to upper shoulder, lower shoulder, wherever it's going to go. And the body goes to the ground. So it was not said to the two parts of the spirit form of man. It was said to the body. And so therefore, whatever this act is, has to do with the body. Now you tell me how you get a body outside of sex. You don't get it. Now, with this in mind, <clears throat> I want to introduce a confirmed biological truth. Scientific. No creation outside of mankind has to learn the act of procreation. No animal has to learn it. No bird has to learn it. No reptile has to learn it. No insect has to learn it. No flowers, no trees, no grass, no vegetables, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. But human beings have to learn how to perform a sexual act to bring forth life. Am I right or wrong? 100% right. And what were they talking about? <clears throat> they were talking about that which has to do with life and procreation. And Brother Branham also mentioned when they come to the place where science figures they really got life figured out and they can produce it, it's all over. And that's what this smart beast was doing. No doubt setting the history and the tenor where this woman will become the great woman of the world. She is setting the pattern. We will lead you into the great things that God has not allowed you to have. And yet they're here so you can use them. And the filthy church does the same thing because she's a woman. She's the one that talks with the voice of authority. Tells you how to bring forth children unto God. Tells you how it's going to be done. Shows you all about it. Leads you right to death. Because remember, the Bible says, fear him. That's, don't fear him that's got power to destroy the body. But fear him that's got power to destroy body and soul in hell. And that's God. There's coming a time when all bodies and all souls will be destroyed in hell. The lake of fire. <coughs> At that time coming. Every creation that procreates or brings forth life in any form at all, any form at all, instinctively can procreate except man. Now, it's not that they don't want to. It's not that woman wouldn't want to. <clears throat> but they don't come into this world instinctively knowing. The instinct is there. The desire is there. But as far as the act of copulation is concerned, Man is the only one that has to learn to do it, and he actually does it. So what did the brilliant and shrewd beast do? The answer to me is simple. He gave Eve the understanding of sexual knowledge and procreation in a manner that brought about the serpent seed, as well as the seed of God. And that has led to the perversion of all creation <clears throat> and all life. Because why? Man was given complete control over the universe of God, especially down here on earth, the beast of the fields, everything else. It was in his power. But listen, when the top man goes haywire, everything under the top man goes haywire too. 
That's why you'll never find God ever changing his mind, ever changing his word, ever doing anything different. You can depend upon God when you know what he did and a certain problem or a certain thing that he wanted. He never, ever, ever, ever changed. He can't. Or he wouldn't be God. <clears throat> so that's my understanding. And you see today, you got the very thing today. Mankind would like to do right now. You know, we brought it out before. They, they said we'd like to now take the animal and the human embryo some way and get them together and make a slave. And I said, they already got him. <clears throat> they had him for 6,000 years. And don't even know it. See, that's how smart they are. But you see, there's no person. Lincoln said this. And I suppose he got it from somebody. Nobody is so smart he can tell a lie or lies. Because why? You forget. That's why God never forgets. He doesn't tell lies. If God told lies, he'd forget. You know as well as I do. The minute you tell a lie, you're, you walk into a trap. <clears throat> you might as well. You know, it's like they said to, to the fellow that, that took the Babylonian garment. And the, and the wedge of silver at the time of Joshua. They, they found out who did it. And they said, confess and give God the glory. Well, he said, yes, I did it. I'm the one that did it. He said, take his family out and the whole bunch and kill him. So, hey, yeah, that's a pretty severe penalty. That doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway. No liar going to get in the, anywhere but the lake of fire. The Bible says so. <clears throat> now, listen. David, the prophet king, type of Christ and a forebearer, in the flesh line of the Lord Jesus Christ said, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So, all right. <clears throat> this is spoken by the prophet king, the type of Jesus Christ. That the act of procreation meant for good and was used for evil is positively evident by the fact that Jesus said, you must be born again and born of the Spirit. <clears throat> so if you got to be born again, and he uses the term literally, begotten over, which is what you're talking about, reconceived and brought forth, there's got to be something wrong with you in the first place. And that has then to do with your birth. And so... Nicodemus said, well, can a man enter the, his mother's womb the second time he'd be born? <clears throat> Jesus said, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being born of the Spirit. So, if you have to be born again and born of the Spirit, and that you were circumvented from immortality by doing a certain thing that caused every child to be born mortal, and you had the process of immortality reversed on you because of that act, then you got to understand what Brother Branham taught was 100% right that the act in the Garden of Eden was sexual. <clears throat> it was a wrong use of what was there. And remember, what was there was to bring forth children unto God, to live in beauty and harmony with no disease. And then after the thousands and thousands of years, progress upward and go on and on in advancement in the kingdom until we would have reached the new Jerusalem <clears throat> and might have even had a specific hand in its creation. But no, the whole thing was blown. <clears throat> The whole thing got out of cater. Now, Peter explains what Jesus said. At least he talks about it. Over in 1 Peter, the first chapter, he talks about being born again. Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, <clears throat> by the word of God which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower thereof falleth away. <clears throat> now, Peter used the word spora, which means to scatter, and it really, it doesn't, not the word sperma. Sperm is a human sperm, <clears throat> male sperm that carries the life to the ovum, 
that produces the fetus and then eventually the child coming forth. But he said, you're just like the grass. You're scattered. It's the same thing Jesus said, planting a field. And he said, the, the grass is today. And it, 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 it goes to seed. It's like uh, cast into an oven. It's very temporary, very ephemeral. <clears throat> it shouldn't be that way, he said. Now, being born again, <clears throat> not of the ephemeral. What does it mean? Being born again, so it's not through the processes of the bodies coming forth by sex, as Brother Branham said, but God recreating what went down now comes up. And Peter says, you should be born again. <clears throat> so we're looking at the same thing Jesus said. So if you should be born again, and you're talking now about that body that the Holy Ghost is given to, to assure you in the resurrection, then your first birth was wrong. So that's where it went wrong. And birth comes by sex. So it came wrong by sex. And his brother Branham preached in marriage and divorce. <clears throat> he traced the whole corrupt system of the world. All the troubles that people have in their marriages. All the troubles they have getting along together. Went right back to the Garden of Eden where Eve sold right out to the serpent. <clears throat> and mingled the two lives. Because that's what seed is all about. It's the bearer of whatever life is there. And so she being a woman who could bear the life of God, the animal came and seminated her, and she bore this monstrosity. That's where your giants came from. <clears throat> all the people want to talk about their refidim and all that stupid stuff. Never believe anything they said. They're a bunch of liars. Brother Branham told us the truth. So we know, all right then, that it was in procreation that it went wrong because now the body dies until one man said right above your mirror born to die and I think it was Browning who was who wrote the poetry concerning <clears throat> the stranger of Galilee but that's not the title of it that this man met Jesus and he recognized that this was God manifesting human flesh so <clears throat> we see here that that whole thing has to do with bodies and where Adam should have been bringing forth every child of God through Eve, and she stopped the, the thing in its, the very inception. And Brother Branham said she should have brought forth Christ, which she would have brought forth because it was going to be the spirit. If you have to be born again to bring forth a body that was brought forth in corruption, and that same body had the life in it of the Holy Spirit, you know jolly well it was that birth that made the whole thing go awry. So that's why you have to be born again. Now, over here in Job, we're going to look at a couple of verses of Scripture. <clears throat> Brother Branham used them in Job 14 and, and in uh, 14, 15. It says, well, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait, will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call and I will answer thee. For thou shalt have a desire to the work of thy hands. You show me <clears throat> what work on man's body God had anything to do with it by his hand, only the forming of the body. He didn't have a thing to do with the spirit forming with, the, with his hands or the soul. The soul was a part of him and the spirit he created. The only thing he formed was the body. Now let's prove that that's the truth. We go to, over here to Job, the 19th chapter. And in, verse, in chapter 19, we find it very <clears throat> clearly written. 25 to 27, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. And he said, though I go to gases and ashes and, and vapor, he said, I'm coming back in the same body I got right now in a glorified state, and it's going to be me and me alone. And I'm going to see my Redeemer. And we're going to stand upon the earth in the last day. <clears throat> These are the last days. And so Job is going to be standing upon this earth very shortly. Part of the Old Testament bride. While we are here in the New Testament bride standing upon this earth here. See? <clears throat> so. 
You have then positively, as Brother Branham brought out, this factor of the wrong birth. So how was it corrected? As Brother Branham said, redemption, which is certainly for our body, eventually has to come <clears throat> back on this earth by some superior, something very superior uh, outside of the seed of God, which we are. It has to be then a superior seed of God for God in order to have that particular sacrifice accepted. So Brother Branham said, now we got looking at redemption. You remember we talked about this several t different times <clears throat> in this message. And he said, look, he said, there's got to be somebody that's worthy, somebody of such stature that is able to redeem us. Now, if you go to, Ro to Hebrews, the 12th, the uh, ninth chapter, we've got a picture here of 22 to 24, and it says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. No forgiveness, period, without the shedding of blood, so forget it. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven be, glorified, be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So that's not the blood of bull and goats, that's the blood of, what is it? For Christ is not entered in the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven now to appear in the presence of God for us. <clears throat> so now, what have we got? We've got the shed blood that gives us remission, and we've got Jesus standing for us. So if you're forgiven and Jesus is standing for you, you now have access to come back in the resurrection. Now let's also take Hebrews 9, 11 to 15. This is the preface of what we read. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this building. He wasn't made with hands. He was born through the Virgin Mary, through the, the, the cells that, the, that his father created, and he came forth. Neither by the bull of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, that's our, this Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now here's a man... <clears throat> A child of God, the only begotten one, with an estate, not like yours and mine, but, but we, we came from the same source, the same father. Here he stands right there, and by the Spirit of God, he's a man full of the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells you that. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, full of, full of the Holy Ghost and faith, went about doing miracles and healing all oppressed of the devil and so on. Here this man stood here, and in that spirit, his own life, the life of God in him, offered himself to God. And that became the sacrifice now for the redemption of the body. Now, as Brother Branham said, there'll come a time when you realize you always were saved. Why is that? Because how could a part of God in you ever sin? John says that part can never sin. Never, never be caught as a sinner. You can't do it. And so Paul brings out very carefully that this is a matter of the redemption of the body and that, of course, is in the book of Ephesians. Now, Hebrews 9 and 11 is definitely the conception. Now, Hebrews 9 and 11, it says in here, but Christ becoming a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, which is to say, not of this building. So he's telling you right here, there's a greater and more perfect tabernacle, and it's not made with hands, it's a human body. <clears throat> so this human body... It's not like our human body. It's different. It's superior. He's not like us. He's one of us, but he's not like us in the sense of exactly who he is and what, how he was qualified to be the Redeemer. So Hebrews 9.11 is definitely the conception, gestation, and birth of Jesus Christ. And his ultimate sacrifice for sins as seen in, he, in Matthew 1, 18 to 23. So let's check that tabernacle out. <clears throat> because the tabernacle means his body. Know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? <clears throat> so Jesus is the tabernacle. <clears throat> so over here in Matthew 1, 18 to 23, <clears throat> uh, the birth of Christ is on this wise. 
When his mother was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she found a child of the Holy Ghost. She was always pregnant before Joseph got to her. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. And, uh, and while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared from heaven and said, Joseph, son of David, fear not taking to marry thy wife, for that which conceived her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that might be fulfilled, spoken by the Lord, <coughs> spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and bring forth a son, and you'll call his name God with us, which being Emmanuel. And then Joseph then came from his sleep, and the firstborn was called Jesus. Now that tells you right there, there was a miraculous conception. Not immaculate, but miraculous. God created the sperm and the egg, and the period of gestation took place, and Jesus came forth. Well, he had a body not like ours, and that's very, very true. The body is not like ours, and that's proven over here in the book of Hebrews, <clears throat> the second chapter, where it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took a part of the same. He took a part in it, but he didn't take it like ours because his body was not like ours. His body's virgin born, and Mary was just a chemical factory supplying the nourishment, and that's all she did. That's all she supplied the nourishment so that he can come forth. <clears throat> now, Brother Branham described the virgin birth of Jesus on many occasions, and we have also done it, according to him. He also gave us the exact res revelation of the son's birth previous to his flesh, in manifestation, <clears throat> fleshly manifestation. He took us back to the beginning where nobody had a clue except Brother Branham. Other prophets no doubt did, but they didn't write it down. That the light came forth, formed from God, and this was a part of God, the Son of God, God giving birth to his own Son, and at the same time giving birth to his Godhead and fatherhood. That was in him. Now the next time Brother Branham talks is when Jesus becomes a man or a baby. And God now creates a sperm, and he, and he folds himself in it, so that therefore, the, fifth, the trays of God, which would be physical, but it cannot be seen, because it's life which is spirit, now can come forth. So therefore, when you saw Jesus, you saw the Father. You literally saw the Father. <clears throat> Not just by tremendous works which were done, by the fact that this was the sperm that God created, and God put his genes into and this became the image of God. That's why he said, don't make any image. I'm going to have my own image. Now remember, we are the image of God. And that image went back there to where man was put in flesh and he was pure and clean and he was a total vessel of God and so was she. But they defiled it. See, now the image come back through Jesus Christ <clears throat> because we now <clears throat> have our redemption. Now, as I mentioned, Paul agrees here with this in Hebrews, but we see Jesus was made a little lower in the angel with suffering the death, crowned with glory and honor. By the grace of God should taste death for every son. That man is not in the scripture. It's every son or every child of God. For it became him from whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's talking about God doing this through Jesus. For both he that sanctifies and they are sanctified are all of one. That's the, that's the children of God and the son of God are all of God. Therefore, he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare my, thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I'll sing praise unto thee. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also took a part of the same. Not all of it, just a part of it. Just a part of it. He was not born like we are through, through, through physical conception, through male and female. No. That, that, through, that through death, he might destroy him or... Make powerless him that has the power of death, that's the devil. And deliver all them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not himself the uh, nature of, and that is the, the form and the, and the, and the uh, character of, of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, which in other words, he's made like unto his brethren. And he became a merciful high priest, a faithful high priest to God, and he made reconciliation or propitiation for the sins of the people. <clears throat> so there's Brother Branham talked about this great one who could redeem us. <clears throat> now, I might not get to what I want to read here tonight, but I'll just go along and get the rest tomorrow if I have to. Brother Branham described the virgin birth of Jesus on many occasions, which we also described to you. And this is how Jesus <clears throat> was the only begotten Son of God, which means he himself said that, 
God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, talking about himself. And that word begotten means unique in that there never was nor ever will be another one like him. He is a unique one. That's what that begotten means, one of a kind. The only begotten one. Because remember, we also are begotten, but we became begotten of God through sex. <clears throat> Down through the line of Adam. Jesus never did. Now, uniquely born. Brother Branham described the, the birth of the virgin born body. <clears throat> now, with what we have taken and Brother Branham have said, we're talking about identification. There are two seeds. One is of God, one is brute. And it's of the devil because the devil inspired the clever beast to do what he did. The beast listened to the devil and the woman listened to the beast and when he, she listened to the beast, she listened to the devil. And now therefore, we have the brute race mixture. Nobody can do a thing about it. The seed of God comes down the same as the seed of the serpent comes down. Pretty soon they're going to crown the seed of the serpent, make him king of the whole world. They'll have to worship him or their lives will be forfeit. But pretty soon, before then, there'll be a bride taken out of this earth and that spirit in their midst will become incarnate to us, no doubt in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're kind of king of king and lord of lords. <clears throat> so, all right. Over here in the book of Ephesians, and it gets me nervous because I know time is running out. But I want you to see what Brother Brown is actually teaching us. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's two people entailed there. One is God, who is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the second person, and he's not God. He's not even a part of Godhead. <clears throat> he's the Lord, for God has made him both Lord and Christ. Worked through him to have this high capacity, which now he's high priest. He's got all kinds of titles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, all these blessings would, would never come, but through the fact we were in him, that he should be to the glory, that he should be holy, that we should be holy and without blame before him. In love, having predestinated us to the placing of his children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of God's own will. <clears throat> now, you'll notice that we were in him, we were children, but we've got to be placed as children. Why? Because we became misplaced. We are not children of disobedience. We are disobedient children. We are not children of darkness. We were children like lost in the darkness. See? To the praise the glory of his grace, whom he hath made us, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. <clears throat> in other words, we come, come back through Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the rich of his grace, when he hath abounded toward us in all his imprudence, having made known us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, <laughs> that in the dispensation and fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. What are he going to do with the rest of them? The ones that were faithful angels and cherubim and all, he keeps the rest will destroy. In whom we have ob obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things according to counsel his own will that we should be to the praise of his glory who first hoped in Christ. The word is hope, not trusted. In whom he also hoped, after he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you received the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance and the redemption of purchase and possession to praise his glory. <clears throat> it tells you right there. You're waiting for the resurrection to get your bodies. Everything else was already there. Everything else by God. Wherefore also I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love for all the saints. Cease not to give thanks to you and make a mention of you in my prayers. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and begun to the spirit of wisdom, revelation, knowledge of him. 
That's the end time spirit coming back to the church. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, you may be, you know, the hope of his calling, what the riches of his glory is inheritance and saints, and what is seen in greatness of power to us who do believe according to the working mighty parts who wrought in Christ who raised from the dead, and set in his own right hand in heaven and places far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name is named, and not in this world but in the world to come. Now it tells you right there that once you when you get to the stage of the inheritance, which is glorification, which is the resurrection, at that time, God comes back to the bride. He comes back and reveals himself to her. <clears throat> and he tells her the things which are hers, sets her on the path of glory. And at that time, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is going to be here to raise us. That's where you get the, the shout, the voice, or the, and the trumpet. <clears throat> the shout is the message. God revealing himself through the prophet, proving who he is. God bringing us down his true word. The, re, the word restored to the bride. The bride restored through the word. <clears throat> and at that time, <clears throat> there'll be a resurrection. And at that time, notice what happens. It says he had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness and filleth all in all. So there you find right there, God moving into Jesus, doing everything he needed to be done. Jesus pouring his fear in the church. Everything going to be there. Now at the end time, you see the new Jerusalem. The lamb on the throne, the pillar, fire above the throne, the bride around the throne, the rest are all there. Now I'm trying to put this in a nutshell because time's gone awfully fast. <clears throat> now, you will notice in, in Ephesians chapter 1, everything is based upon predestination and predestination is based upon God. So therefore, God, predestination, down here. Down here, nothing, unless God predestinates. Every plant that my heavenly Father hath not planted will be uprooted, destroyed. Predestination. Predestination. Now you don't want to believe it, that's your tough luck. Even as Brother Branham just died, the big fight was on. Predestination, can't have it, can't have it. They never came out of Pentecostals. They're right back in Pentecostal spiritual bankruptcy. Predestination. Don't you ever forget it. Predestination. The seed of God are predestinated. They have a predestiny. They come from glory to go back to glory. And as Jesus went back to a greater glory, so do they go back to a greater glory. And as God poured into Christ his fullness of what he became a body, Jesus now pours the church to hit the body of the church. And as God raised Jesus, God raises the bride. And we're raised up there together. Now keep that in mind. We're talking of predestination. <clears throat> okay. With that comes Galatians, the fourth chapter. Now watch what we're going to read here. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them under the law, that we might receive the placing of sons. <clears throat> In other words, the only chance, the only opportunity any predestinated child of God had to make the predestination that God had for him was Jesus Christ coming and dying upon Calvary, shedding his blood and something else. Now watch. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Father, Father. It doesn't say you become a son. It says you are a son. See, that's why you must be born again. You, the individual <clears throat> that came from God, you are born again. You were born wrong the first time in the sense of your birth being that which led you to destruction and to death, foisted upon you, not having done it, but being heir to it. Now everyone dies in sin. But now through Jesus, the rebirth, which is what? The baptism with the Holy Ghost. So it comes to sons, not reprobates, not goats, not serpency, not derelict, not creation, 
No, no, it doesn't come to creations. It comes to children. And the word son should never be used sons anyway, it's born ones. The born ones of God, which are both male and female. Now listen to verse 13 of chapter 3. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. What is that blessing? What is the blessing of Abraham? I'll read it to you. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The baptism with the Holy Ghost is the rebirth. And it can only come to sons who had the wrong birth. <laughs> and now you've got the right birth, which is the rebirth by the Spirit of God, guaranteeing you what? Coming into the physical birth that is right, that you missed the first time. God creating again, not by sex, as Brother Branham said, by, by, by the petroleum, the potash, and the, and the elements that 53 or how many are, who knows, that comprise the human body, God bringing about a resurrection. Now, <clears throat> I don't have time to read to you all of Galatians, which continue on in the fourth chapter. <clears throat> but I will read part of it. We have a little more time left? How many? Seven. Seven. All right, my little children, Verse 19, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Now listen to what he stands in doubt of. Tell me, you the desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? Well, of the law, Christ was born under the law to get you into the resurrection. So now they're denying Christ. And where are you going? Back to the law. Now to keep listening. For it is written, no, do you desire to be in the law? Do you not hear the law? For it's written, Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was the bond woman was born after the flesh, serpent seed. But he of the four, free woman was born of promise, election, predestination, which things are an allegory. For there are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendered the bondage, which is Hagar. And this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answered Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage to her children. But the Jerusalem, which is above, is free, and is our mother. Are you listening? And listen carefully. For it's written, Rejoice thou that the barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she that hath a husband. The little bond me. <clears throat> the little girl that was used for sex, like Eve was. That's all she's used for. And now, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. He's speaking of two seeds here. Now he said, You Galatians, you don't understand the two seeds. You won't accept the reality of being from God and a part of God. You won't accept the truth of serpent seed. No, you've got everybody, a bunch of goats transformed into, into beautiful sheep. You've got this thing all ironed out. We're all reprobate and subject. Hallelujah, this beautiful God comes down through Jesus and transforms us. Hogwash. There never has been or never will be a change in species. Look around you. I said just the other day, look around this universe and they try to tell us the earth has been in progress here and in, 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 in evolution for five billion years. It would take trillion, trillion, trillion times, trillion years to bring forth what we got now by evolution. Hogwash, junk, corruption, blasphemy. I get so sick of the whole mess. I'd like to light the fire if it doesn't come quick enough. <clears throat> now, here is your true legalist. He can't see the two seeds. It ends up striving to be the seed of God. Not knowing that it's either one or the other, you are or you aren't. That's as far as I'm going to go. <clears throat> Tomorrow we can... If I can get back in good enough shape. <clears throat> we'll try to get where I want to show you. 
Your brother Branham is telling you exactly what I'm telling you. They simply can't get it. Two seeds, predestination. One is predestinated by God. The records are there perfectly. The others are merely written about. Therefore, their names can be taken out of the book of life, which they are. That's what you see at the end time. Because it all begins with lamb life, the life of God. And then the perversion enters where the body which was made, formed for the child of God, becomes a vehicle of death instead of immortality. But we must get back to immortality because that's the law of the child of God. And we found tonight how it was done. And we know it has been done. And we're in the process even now of entering in through the seventh seal to eternity and the new heavens and the earth, earth because that's where the seventh seal evidently takes its fullness I don't say it's conclusion or it could be I'm not that learned but we're into it now let's bow our heads in prayer Heavenly Father we want to thank you for the time we spent together your goodness and your mercy O God which endures forever we just ask you Lord to bless each one to understand what Brother Branham was trying to bring to the people there, no doubt in a hostile congregation or at least in a congregation that didn't understand or didn't care or perhaps came only, Lord, to see miracles or hear something <clears throat> in the sense of discernment. As it were, Lord, like you even told the prophet, it was too much like a sideshow, which, was, which we know, Lord, is a pitiful thing to realize that the God of glory, the great God, could be so humbled, as it were, before the world. But Lord, tonight we pray that, that somehow as we get a hold of the truth and preach it, that somehow this same truth, Lord, takes a hold of us in a way to give you a greater glory and more sincerity and honor than we've ever done before. And that will satisfy us as nothing else ever could or would. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of Jesus, amen.